There's a teaching that the Buddha repeated several times toward the end of his life, telling his students that they had to make themselves their refuge. He wasn't going to be around much longer. So it was up to them to provide themselves with protection. He says, you make yourself your refuge by making the Dharma your refuge. And you make the Dharma your refuge by practicing the establishing of mindfulness. Starting out, say, with the breath. You focus on the breath, and then you do what you can to remember to stay with the breath. And you watch yourself. You watch the breath to see how the breath is going. Watch the mind to see how the mind is going. And then you're ardent, trying to get rid of unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones. That ardency is based on a quality that's called appropriate attention. That too is one of your inner refuges. It's what lies at the beginning of right view. That's something you have to remember as well. What is skillful? What is not skillful? If something unskillful comes up, how do you get rid of it in an effective way? This you learn from listening to others and also from observing yourself. In fact, as the Buddha said, right view, appropriate attention, can come from two things. One is from outside influences. Someone else points you in the right direction. And the other is from your own contemplation to your being able to see, yes, it is true that these qualities are skillful and unskillful. But in the same way, there are dangers that come both from outside and from within. There are people outside that would be very all too happy to teach you wrong view. In some cases, they're pretty insistent that their views are right, but they're really, really wrong. And then you yourself can begin to engage in what the Buddha calls inappropriate attention. It's just forgetting about the questions of what you're doing and whether it's skillful or not, and getting tied up in other issues. So you need protection on both sides, both from outside and from inside. Because if people get you to adopt wrong view, they can also convince you that, say, the precepts aren't important, that it's perfectly okay and maybe even praiseworthy to break precepts now and then. And that's going to be for your long-term harm. This is something special about the Buddha's understanding of dangers. They're both outside and inside. Nowadays we have politicians who tell us that all the dangers are out there, and they're going to protect us from the dangers out there. And then you've got the New Age people who say, well, all the dangers are inside. And when you don't realize that you are one with all beings, or going to connect with all beings, you're going to do unskillful things. But if you realize oneness, you'll automatically be okay, and the oneness is something you can trust. And both of those teachings are teaching you to be heedless. In other words, you look at the dangers in the wrong places, or have a one-sided view of where the dangers are. So as we live in this land of wrong view, it's important to keep in mind that, yes, there are dangers outside. There are people who would be teaching us things or simply taking for granted certain views and hoping that we'll be taking those views for granted as well, that ultimately are for a long-term harm. So as you go out into the world, remind yourself that okay, right view is something you've really got to hold on to. Your precepts are something you really have to hold on to. It's the politicians who say, Watch out, someone's going to come and take your wealth, they're going to take this, take that. They're going to harm your relatives. The Buddha said loss in those cases is very minor. You don't go to hell for losing those things. 
you can go to hell for losing your virtue and losing your right view. So those are the things you've got to protect. And of course, there are voices inside the mind that are all too happy to tell you to develop wrong view. So it's important as you go through life, realizing which things are the things you have to hold on to, which things you have to let go. The Buddha doesn't need you just to let go of everything. This is a constantly repeated image in the, among the forest of John. So stages in the path where you really have to hold on. John Mahabhu is this, the image of the ladder. You hold on to one rung, and then you hold on to the rung higher than that, and only when you've gotten a firm grip on the higher rung do you let go of the lower rung and then reach up from the one that's still higher. Hold on to that. And that way you ultimately get up to the roof. It's when you're on the roof that you can let go of the ladder entirely. Ananda's image was of crossing over a river and going from one, basically one stepping stone to the next stepping stone. You go from one thing that you hold on to to another thing you hold on to. Or as he said, one clinging to the next clinging. So don't believe the voice inside or out that says you have to let go of everything. Or if you're holding on to some aspect of the practice here, on a lowly level of the practice. If you want to get to a higher level, you have to let go. There's that famous image of the raft. And everyone focuses on the end of the story when you get to the other side of the river, and that's when you let go of the raft. You don't carry it around. But they forget to focus on the fact that while you're crossing the river, you have to hold on tight to the raft. And you have to make an effort. There's actually a Mahayana version of that image that says, to get across the river, you have to let go of the raft. And I've never seen that work in any way at all. So hold on to your right view, hold on to your, your virtue. Hold on to appropriate attention. Hold on to your good friends, whether they're good friends outside or good friends inside, the admirable, fr admirable friends. The ones who keep reminding you what is for your own true well-being. Well now, this doesn't mean that you abandon all your other friends. The Buddha does recognize that they're what he calls, might be called loyal friends. The ones who would be willing to sacrifice for you, would help you, stick with you in, in hard times. But they too, he said, should be the kind of people who, when they notice that you're doing something unskillful, try to steer you away from that. So recognize that your good friends come in two kinds, the loyal ones and the admirable ones. And you should be loyal to your loyal friends, but the ones you really listen to, the ones whose advice you really take to heart, are the admirable friends. But of course, knowing who's admirable and who's not, that depends on your own powers of judgment. It keeps coming back to you. You've got to be your own refuge. But to protect you from outside dangers, the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha are offered as good examples. When you think about what the world has to offer and the prices you have to pay in order to get what the world has to offer, think about the Buddha's values. Would he make that deal? Sometimes some of the offers are perfectly fine as far as the virtue is concerned. There'd be no problem. It's when there's some difficulty in terms of the virtue, difficulty in terms of the precepts. That's a time when you have to sometimes be willing to make sacrifices. But it's a sacrifice of a short-term good for a long-term good. So these are some of the ways in which 
you develop mindfulness, then mindfulness to be skillful, rooted in the breath, so you're rooted in the present moment, with a sense of well-being, then it makes it a lot easier to make the skillful decision. That's how you find true protection and true refuge. from dangerous both inside and out.